this parable drives me crazy. The reason why this parable drives me crazy is why in God's name is the sower of the seed just throwing the seed wherever it might go? Why is he not thinking like, oh, I should prepare the soil, I should make it all nice, and then sow the seed? Well, what I learned is that ancient farmers in Israel, because it's a hot place, um, do this. This is a regular practice that they do. And part of it is that the type of soil that they have is kind of like our soil. It's that like hard, hard panny soil. And so they cast the seed and they cast it wide and then they plow the rows and then they um, sow the seed in. And the reason for that is to protect the seed from birds and to protect the seed from the scorching of the sun. So Again, this is something we don't understand because modern farming is not that way. We understand that you're supposed to plow rows and sow the seed and water it and weed it, and then you deal with it. But they did it in a different way. And so that's why the seed was sown less strategically than we would think would make the most sense. And so logically, for us, that makes sense. Um, that they weren't wasting resources and energy, but rather they were doing something that was protecting the seed and protecting the soil. And so when Jesus is talking about good soil, what is he really talking about? So if they're casting the seed and they're casting it wildly and wherever it may land, what does it mean to be good soil? And that is when he's talking about the fact that people who hear the word of God and the soil, and it takes root in their hearts, and it stays there. And see, really, that's the point of this parable, is that some of them are going to, he some people are going to hear the word of God, and they are going to take it and run with it, and it's going to bear beautiful fruit. And some of people are going to hear it and be like, cool, that was nice, and walk away. And we have to be okay with that. We have to be okay with casting the seed, see the seed widely and then just being like, all right, God, you've got to deal with this. So Jesus, why, why so cagey? Why the middle part of the passage where he's like, some people are going to hear, but they're not going to listen and they are not going to understand. Why do some people hear the gospel and it takes root and some people, they don't? And so in order, we ha in order to answer that question, we have to really look at what a parable is in the first place. So a parable is something, a story, that is placed alongside something else in order to bring clarification. And yet the parables reveal through concealment. The disciples heard, and they didn't even really understand what the, what the parable meant. But uh, Professor Edwards, he's a professor at Whitworth, and he described it as this. He says, it is, the parables are like a hook hidden by the bait. So if you've ever been fishing before and you want to catch a fish, you don't just throw a hook in the water because the fish would be like, yeah, no, thanks for playing. I'm not going to put my mouth in that because then I'm going to get taken away. But they see this beautiful, shiny thing. They see this beautiful, shiny bait and then they get hooked. And so that is what the parables are for. The parables are meant to draw us into the story, to draw us into the story of the kingdom of God. They are the bait. And then we get hooked. So Mark only has two chapters of parables. He's not like Luke who has parables all throughout his gospel. He has chapters and chapters and chapters and chapters and chapters upon parables. And Mark put this parable first of all the parables that are in his gospel because he was saying, if you don't understand this one, you don't understand the kingdom of God, and you're not going to get the rest of the parables that I'm going to tell. So in order to understand the kingdom of God, we really have to understand this parable. And this parable is about the proclamation of the gospel and how it is received. See, Jesus is revealing that 
there are some who are not going to hold on to the knowledge that the seed is going to be sown wide. This is a new thing that is taking place. Jesus is saying that the seed is going to be sown widely. Before, the seed was just sown like over here to certain people in a certain place. But now, the seed is going to be sown so that everybody can hear it. But not everybody is going to hear it. See, what Jesus is saying is that more are included. A wider net has been cast. But there are some who are going to say, oh my gosh, this is the most incredible thing that I have ever heard and turn their life to Jesus. And some people are just going to be like, oh, nice story, and walk away. They're not going to hear the beautifulness of the kingdom of God that's in the midst of that. They're not going to hear the reason for following Jesus. So when Will was a young toddler, he was about 18 months, two years, we had to do what all parents have to do. We had to make a decision about safety. Will was climbing out of the crib, and he, <laughs> he would jump out of the crib, and there was a red rocking chair that was next to his bed. He would jump out of the crib, roll into the rocking chair, roll out of the rocking chair, and then onto the floor. He had figured out a way for his little head and his body to stay safe, um, but it was creating a safety hazard. And so we moved him into a big boy bed. Really, we just took the front part of his, um, the front part of his crib off for a very long time. And Will was never a good napper. His preschool teachers are here. They could tell you what a terrible napper he is. I'm sorry, Mrs. Cheatham. He was like the worst last year. Um, he never, ever was quiet during nap time, even though he was supposed to be, unless he was sick or growing. Um, and his little, like, he realized that now I can get out of bed. Now I have autonomy. Now. I can do whatever I want to do. And so I would put him down for a nap. And five seconds later, he'd open the door because he'd gotten up. And I'd, we'd put him down again. We'd go through the ritual again. Every parent has gone through this. Um, we'd put him down again. This happened like a hundred times every nap time. Finally, one day, usually in my frustration, I would get in his little face and I'd be like, William! probably a little louder than that, I'd be like, William, you need to nap. It is good for your brain development. It is good for your growth. It is good for mommy's sanity. <laughs> he didn't care. He looked me in the face and said, no nap, mommy. I think that happened hundreds upon hundreds of time. <laughs> and <laughs> as a rational adult, it's like, I don't know why you don't understand this. But this is what happens, too, with the word of God. Some people hear it and they're like, no, not today, mommy. And some people hear it and they're like, yes, this makes sense. And so our responsibility as people of faith is to cast that wide net. Our responsibility as people of faith is to throw the seed and let God work in people's lives. To say, there you go, because today may be the day that that person hears. Today may be the day that someone hears the word of God and they needed to hear it. So I'm going to talk about the middle part of this passage, the part where Jesus says, I can seal so that they don't hear. This is the part that's not in the other Gospels. This is the part that is hard to hear. And this is the part where you're like, wait, 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 Jesus. You just said that the word of God is cast out widely. It's cast for everyone. So why are you holding back? Why are you making it so some people don't understand? Why are you making it so don't you love everyone? Don't you want to be in relationship with everyone? Don't you want everyone to get it? We all smile and hold hands and be kumbaya. But the thing is, is that this knowledge that Jesus imparts can only be heard 
when the Holy Spirit lets people hear it. I'm not sure why the revelation of God, why some people are not open to the Holy Spirit and the revelation of God and this knowledge that Jesus has for us. But some people will hear the word and nothing will happen. But we have to be okay with that because the message of Christ is not just for us. The message of Christ is for everyone on earth. And when we cast that net widely, there is the potential that it can grow greatly. So at the end of this passage, at the end of the the parable, Jesus says that when it finally lands on good soil, that the results are 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, a normal crop, an average crop, yields seven and a half, seven and a half, seven and a half, yeah, seven and a half fold. So, tenfold is an amazing crop. But what Jesus is saying is if, if it falls into good soil, that it's going to yield 30, 60, 100 fold. This crop is no ordinary crop. And so, our job, our responsibility, is to sow that seed widely and let Christ do the work in people's lives. Because the time for the harvest is now. Because the word has to be sown, the word needs to be sown. So I have shared before about when I really came to faith. And that was in high school, um, after I had like a near-death experience falling off a cliff. If you want to hear more about that, you can watch my sermon from February. Um, But part of what helped me to really grow and develop my faith was the amazing people that were around me who were helping to grow and develop my faith. And one of those people was this amazing woman named Mary West. Now, Mary West was a volunteer in our high school group. Mary West was not your typical high school group volunteer. Mary West was in her late 70s. Mary West, in her early 70s, had climbed to the base of Mount Everest. She had traveled all over the world. She was an extraordinary woman. But Mary had come to faith later in life. Mary actually came to faith in her 70s. And she had said, yes, I'd heard the word of God before, but something Something stuck. And so I want to work with high school girls. I want to work with young women so that they would hear the word of God and hear it maybe a little earlier, make some better choices than I made in my life, although she had this extraordinary life, um, and follow Jesus earlier. I'm going to do a little side note right now. This is why 70-year-olds should volunteer for high school group. Sorry, Mike. I'm inviting 70-year-olds because... High schoolers, middle schoolers, children, they need to have people of all ages in their lives who are telling them about the love of Jesus Christ. Because had I not had Mary West in my life, maybe I would have seen God differently. I don't know. So if you're like, if you've been feeling that like twinkle in your heart that you might want to volunteer, but you're like, oh, I'm too old. You're never too old. Mary West shows that you're never too old. Um, Anyway, Mary spent the next year really speaking into my life about Jesus Christ and about the transformative nature of Jesus Christ in our lives. And she said, for years and years it fell on rocky soil, and then one day my heart was open. One day, I was ready to hear. For some reason, when God's word was sown in my life, I was ready and open for the Spirit to speak. And Mary spent the rest of her life serving Jesus Christ. And she spent the rest of her life mentoring people like me into faith and into deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why it's our job to spread the word wide. Because maybe we're speaking into a Mary West's life. 
Maybe we're speaking into someone's life who's heard the story over and over and over again, and this time they're going to hear. This time, it's the right soil. Now they are ready. So when we hear the parable of the sower, we are reminded that we are called to do like Jesus did, to do like the sower did, and spread the seed widely. Spread it wherever we go, whatever we do, even if you think you are wasting your time. Because it's our responsibility, it's our job as people of faith to spread the word of Jesus Christ and to let the Spirit do the planting. Let us pray. God, this day, if our hearts are being nudged, that there's someone in our lives who needs to hear about your love today. Help us be bold. Help us be brave. Help us to spread that seed and to trust you to do the work. God, we thank you for those people in our lives who taught us about faith, who taught us what it meant to be a follower of you, who were willing to take that step. God, help us to be those people for other people in our lives. And God, this morning, we pray especially for the people right now who are struggling with Hurricane Florence. We pray for the families of the 15 people who have died. Pray for those who are going to have to deal with flooded houses and rebuilding and restoring their lives. God, we are thankful for the work of organizations like the Red Cross and Presbyterian Disaster Assistance and many other groups that come in and work with these people. And God, we pray for your restoration to come, for your hope and your love to be shown. God, this morning you are continuing to teach us what it means to be your followers, just as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Spread the word far and spread the word often, right? Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Everybody, good job. Thank you. Because it's, it's important to hear it. It's important to, to have it heard over and over again. And there are people in our midst today that are doing exactly what Liz has been talking about which is spreading God's word through, through love, through education, through intentional interactions. And that's our amazing preschool staff here at First Presbyterian Church uh, Preschool. We've invited some of, those, some of our staff, our teachers here today to be with us this morning, not just so we can po point at them and say, you work with kids? So let's point at them for a second. If you're one of our preschool teachers, raise your hand right over here. Okay, everybody turn. Okay, give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. And you can now point at them and go, you work with kids? And some of y'all aren't even like 70 years old. I mean, you could come hang out and work in the high school ministry, according to Liz, and we would love that. As a matter of fact, we'd love any of, of, of our church to work alongside our students and our children. I just spent the first half of the service in our children's ministry having a good time over there, and I get to see the fruit of your labor. 
of the, the years that you work with our kids in preschool as they develop into young men and young women of faith, the love that our preschool family, our preschool teachers, that has poured into them, well, we get to experience that in the children's ministry department. And the preschool here at our church isn't a separate entity. In some, school, in some churches, it is the preschool and its own private, completely locked away, different organization. And then there's the church, which is way over here, a completely separate organization, sharing only name. That is not the story of our church. Our church is one under the same umbrella. We are a church that has a preschool that is one of our ministries, and some of the finest ministers in town are our amazing preschool teachers and staff. And so I think it's appropriate for us as a church that we pray for them because they interact with about 250 different kids, about 200 families all over North County. They are one of our biggest missional steps into our world. And so I want to encourage us in these next few moments to lift them up. You can say random preschool teacher if you want. If you know some of their names, say their names. After the service, there's going to be coffee in the Fellowship Hall. I encourage you to grab a coffee and share a little bit of information with them. Let them know that you love them and support them. Can you all pray with me as we lift up our preschool teachers? Great God, we know how hard it is to be parents. We know how hard it is when there's someone constantly tugging on your leg, someone constantly demanding your attention, someone constantly need, need, need. Father, we don't know what it's like when that's where we come to work and there's 42 of them every day and all of them need a tissue, all of them need a wipe, all of them are hurting over someone, someone took their toy, someone touched this, someone's breathing the air, Lord. Father, we thank you for the men and the women of our preschool team. And we lift them up today. We ask that your spirit would be continuing to move in them, granting them peace beyond their generation, granting them, them an endurance of happiness and joy that overflows into the lives of their students and families. And Father, we pray and we continue to pray this, uh, that we might, as a church, and ministry be one, sharing in the same goal, the same mission, and spreading the seed far, wide, and often. And we thank you for every one of those folks that works alongside us here. We pray this in your son's holy name, and everyone here said? Can you guys give the preschool teachers another big hand?